for the Galatians chapter 4. Before we get started, I want to uh, just give you a little bit of a heads up here that if you haven't figured it out, the book of Galatians is in a lot of ways a continuation of the book of Romans. There's going to be a lot of things that are going to be, be uh, very similar about the remainder of this book and the book of Romans itself. So if you've got, uh, if you've got the book of Galatians in chapter 4, go ahead and uh, find as well Romans chapter 8 because you might want to flip to it when we're, when we're getting to this thing. But when you, uh, when you got it, somebody say amen and let's stand in honor and reading of the Word of God. All right, Galatians chapter 4, if the Bible's like mine, be on page 1393. Now I say that the heir, as long as he is a child, differeth nothing from a servant, though he be lord of all. But as under tutors and governors until the time appointed of the Father, even so we, when we were children, were in bondage under the elements of the world. But when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth His Son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. And because ye are sons, God hath sent forth the Spirit of His Son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father, wherefore thou art no more a servant, but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. How be it then, when ye knew not God, ye did service unto them which by nature are no gods? But now... After that ye have known God, or rather, are known of God, how turn ye again to the weak and beggarly elements, whereunto ye desire again to be in bondage? Ye observe days and months and times and years? I'm afraid of you, lest I have bestowed upon you labor in vain. Brethren, I beseech you, be as I am, for I am as ye are." Ye have not injured me at all. Ye know how through infirmity of the flesh I preached the gospel unto you at the first. And my temptation was in my flesh. Ye despised not, nor rejected, but received me as an angel of God, even as Christ Jesus. Where is then the blessedness ye spake of? For I bear you record that if it had been possible, ye would have plucked out your own eyes and have given them to me. Am I therefore become your enemy? Because I tell you the truth, they zealously affect you, but not well. Yea, they would exclude you that ye might affect them. But it is good to be zealously affected always in a good thing, and not only when I am present with you, my little children, of whom I travail and birth again until Christ be formed in you. I desire to be present with you now, and to change my voice, for I stand in doubt of you. Tell me, ye that desire to be under the law, do ye not hear the law? For it is written that Abraham had two sons, the one by bondmaid, the other by free woman. But he who was of the bond woman was born after the flesh, but he of the free woman was by promise. Which things are an allegory, for these are the two covenants, the one from the Mount Sinai, which gendereth to bondage, which is Agar. For this Agar is Mount Sinai in, Ab in Arabia, and answereth to Jerusalem, which now is, and is in bondage with her children. But Jerusalem, which is above, is free, which is the mother of us all. For it is written, Rejoice, thou bear that bearest not. Break forth and cry, thou that travailest not. For the desolate have, hath many more children than she ha which hath an husband. Now we, brethren, as Isaac was, are the children of promise. But as then... He that was born after the flesh persecuted him that was born after the Spirit, even so it is now. Nevertheless, what saith the Scripture? Cast out the bondwoman and her son, for the son of the bondwoman shall not be heir with the son of the free woman. So then, brethren, we are not children of the bondwoman, but of the free. Father God, Lord, we come to you, Lord, today in the name of Jesus, Lord, the name above all names, God. Lord, we thank you today for the reading and the hearing of your word, Lord. Lord, we thank you today for the adoptions of sons that you've given to us, Lord. We thank you for making a way where there was no way, Lord. We thank you for covering us in the blood of your son, Lord, and bringing us into your family, Lord. Lord, we thank you for all that you do. But most of all, we thank you for sending your your son to die on the cross for our sins, Lord. And we, we thank you, Lord, that, that he was dead, buried, and rose again, Lord, and we can believe on him. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Now be seated. <clears throat> In Galatians chapter 3, 
Paul likens the Mosaic and the Levitical laws to a schoolmaster. In Galatians 3 and 24, he says, Wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ, that we might be justified by faith. Now, the role of the schoolmaster is to teach. Now, when we when you're using schoolmaster, we're not talking about a, a principal. Everybody, everybody in here, if you went to school, you had a you had a principal. This is more of like a, a homeschool scenario. You just had that one teacher, or or back if you if you're old enough to maybe remember when there might have been one teacher period, and, and you have multiple groups in one classroom. This is what type of schoolmaster is being being spoken of here. If you want to see a, a good example of it, go right down to the. Uh, um, the state park there, Andrew Jackson State Park, and you can see one of the first schools that were, was ever in this area. It's a, a room smaller than the room that we're in right now, and it, but it housed all the children that were going to school in that area, and it was the, the, that's where the schoolmaster would have been at. Now, the schoolmaster's role, like I said, is to teach, but people tend to look at these Mosaic laws and the Levitical laws as bad things, you know, like going to the principal's office. It's a, they look at it as it's a bad thing. But they're not bad things. They're wonderful teachers. In fact, today, if you've got a principal, most likely they're a principal because they were a wonderful teacher. The law itself, the Mosaic and the Levitical laws, were not terrible things. They were wonderful teachers. And I'm going to go out on a limb because that's where fruit's at. And I, I want to let you know that the law, the Mosaic and the Levitical law, are actually better evangelists than most Christians. I would go out on a limb and say the, the law was a better evangelist than I am. The law is a better evangelist than anybody that you can really think of because the law did something with such finesse that it's just amazing here. The, the law proves to us beyond the shadow of any doubt that we are in no way capable of meeting the standard of holiness required to go to heaven. The law is proof that we need a Savior. And that, that makes the law one of the greatest evangelists and probably one of the greatest schoolmasters possible. The law is almost perfect. Almost. But the law has one major weak link. And the weak link is the person that's trying to keep it. Romans 8, verses 2 through 3. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin condemned sin in the flesh. Until God sent Jesus Christ to fulfill the law, the law was nothing but a frayed rope that people were lowering themselves down into hell by. Now you think about that. A rope, a rope is breaking. You're getting, you're getting lowered down. and Your only hope is if you can keep this law until Jesus came, Jesus came onto the scene. And that rope's fraying and it's, and it's breaking. And you can hear it popping. One, one pop, two pop, three pop. And it's, you think you may want to climb up this thing, but you can't do anything. Because it doesn't matter if you start climbing. It's fraying up there at the top. And you're not going to make it. It's going to break and you're going to bust hell wide open. That's exactly what the law showed us there. That, that you couldn't do it. And even, even if you had the strength to, to wheel yourself up that rope and to pull yourself up, that rope's frayed and it's going to pop. It's only as strong as the weakest link. And, it let, and for some weird turn of events, you were this mighty spiritual being, and you could, you could climb up there that weakly Adam up at the top. He done messed it up for everybody. And people were lowering themselves down to hell with the rope that was the law. There is no hope whatsoever in the law. And it taught us that. As we pick up here in chapter 4, Paul's using some of the cultural traditions as a type of the law now. Galatians 4, uh, starting verse 1. Now I say that the heir, as long as he is a child, differeth nothing from a servant, though he be lord of all, but is under tutors and governors until the time appointed of the father. Now the Galatians, the Romans, and the Jews, they had certain traditions 
when it comes to raising children. While a child might be heir of everything that his father has, that child has to be taught the ways of his people before that child is given the responsibility of everything that comes along with being an heir. That's kind of like a... What, what's, the th what's the thing they do where, you have a, uh, where your child hasn't come of age and, and you have somebody responsible for them until they come of age? And Y'all you know, know what I'm talking about there. And, but you're waiting until that child hits that certain age before you give them everything that, that belonged to, to mom and daddy if, if mom and daddy happened to have passed before, before they hit that certain age on their own. Now, now, this is how the Galatians, the Romans, and the Jews operated. People still operate this way today. They, they wait on that child to, to come into uh, to a maturity, a mature state. Now, what we were waiting on here with the law is we were waiting on Christ to come to fulfill the law. Nobody was going to be ready until, until this particular thing happened. Even so, we, when we were children... We're in bondage under the elements of the world. But when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth His Son, made of a woman, made under the law. Now, God's a loving God. And some of His greatest acts of love are taught through chastisement. I might not believe that, but you know, one of the greatest things you can do for a young one is whip them. That's one of the greatest things when they, when they need it. Not when you want to give it, but when, when they need it. When you're correcting them, when you're chastising them, when you're bringing them back into a right relationship. Proverbs 13 and 24 says, He that spareth his rod hateth his son. But he that loveth him chastiseth him be times. Now he's back there. You can ask him, Daddy, whip me every day whether I need it or not. He must have loved me. God's given every uh, he, he's given the Jews every opportunity to love him instead of loving him they've gone about prostituting themselves to every false idol and every false god that they could and they're still actively doing this today at this very moment what's today's date let's see october 30th 2022 11:29 at this very moment, the Jews are prostituting themselves off to a false Messiah right now. And by Jews, I'm not talking about those dirty, filthy Jews up there running New York and Los Angeles and Hollywood. I'm not talking about the, those Jews. I'm talking about the rabbis. I'm talking about you know the ones with the, the dreadlocks and the funny hats. And the, I'm talking about those guys right now in Israel prostituting themselves out to every false idol imaginable, including lifting up a man that they're calling the Messiah right now as we speak. Go look it up. Not just onesies and twosies on rabbis. You've got the, the most influential rabbis on the planet as we speak calling one man Messiah right now. This is the same kind of nonsense that led God to give him the law to begin with. The law is designed to show the Jews first that whether it be by self-righteousness or by a false God or a false Messiah, there is no hope outside of Jesus Christ who came. Let's jump right into verse 5. To redeem them that were under the law that we might receive the adoptions of sons. We need to understand exactly what it is that God did for us. God could not overlook our sin. Hey, it, it's just, it just is what it is. It's just like when, when you have a child and they do something wrong. You can't overlook it or the child's not going to learn from it. First off, you've got to chastise that child. I don't mean you've got to beat them half to death. That means you've got to chastise them and get them back in a, in a right relationship. And God is so holy... He cannot overlook even the smallest sin. He can't forgive anything. He can't allow us in fellowship with Him until that sin debt is paid. We're not capable of paying it. Only God was holy enough to be able to pay it. So God had to become flesh and pay that sin debt for us. Do something that we couldn't do. Now, you may think to yourself, well, well God could have, he could have come down as a mighty warrior and just demolished everything. It didn't work that way. A man 
legally lost our right relationship with God. A man legally lost what our heritage with God was, and it would take a man to get it back. So God became a man of flesh, blood, and bone to pay that debt. John chapter 1, verse 1 through 5, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men, and the light shineth in the darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. John 1 and 14, And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Something we need to realize and wrap our little brains around is that the Bible is a bloody, bloody, bloody book. Verse 5 tells us that Jesus came to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons, this redemption could only happen through the shedding of blood. Ephesians 1 and 7, "...in whom we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of His grace." Those New Age Bible perverters, they want to do everything they can. They want to remove the blood. They want to whitewash the entire Bible for their own benefit. They've got some kind of agenda out there to point people to something other than the blood of Christ for salvation. I, it's, it's tomfoolery is what it is. It's ridiculous. Now, the Bible, as I told you, is a bloody book. And if we're going to be saved... We're going to go through the blood or we're not going to be saved, period. And we may not be born with Christ's blood in us, but when we're born again, we're born again with His blood on us. And we're made to be sons by faith in the Son. John 1 and 12 but as many as received him, to him gave to, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. That's how we did it. We, we believed on his name. We believed on what he did. We believed the gospel. Uh, we believed that he he lived that perfect life. We believed that he he gave himself on the cross, cross of Calvary, shed his blood for us, was dead, buried, and rose again the third day. According to the Scriptures, we, be, we believe on His name. Let's go on to verse 6 here. And because ye are sons, God hath sent forth the Spirit of His Son into your heart, crying, Abba, Father. Now, verse 6 gives us a crystal clear picture of what adoption looks like. Here we have the Spirit of Jesus dwelling inside of the believer, calling out, Abba, Father. Father. That word Abba literally means Father itself. So it's like they're saying Father, Father, but instead of saying Father, Father, they're saying Abba, Father, because they're calling out one in their own language. Remember, this is a, a picture of adoption. And, it, and to put it into perspective for you, imagine adopting a child that speaks another language. And they cry out to you, Abba, because it's their language. And then, but they want that real good, intimate relationship with you because you've just adopted them. You've given them everything that you give your sons. So not only are you Abba to them in their language, but your father to them in your language is Abba, Father. This is, a, this is a very personal relationship and a picture of what adoption looks like. When the Spirit of God is dwelling in the heart of the new believer, we'll seek that more intimate relationship with our Abba, Father, God. Verse 7, Therefore thou art no more a servant, but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. The Apostle Paul, he's talking to folks here who've already believed on Jesus. They're already adopted into the family. At least that's what they've professed to do so. There is a likelihood here that the people that Paul's talking to are, have only given lip service to the Lord. But that's not what the Word says, it says specifically. So we're going to treat them 
I'm under the assumption here that Paul is talking to believers that have gone off and chased the fables of men. Galatians 4, verse 8. How be it then, when ye knew not God, ye did service unto them which by nature are no gods, but now, after ye have known God, or rather are known of God, how turn ye again to the weak and beggarly elements, whereunto ye desire again to be in bondage? Ye observe days and months and times and years. I'm afraid of you, lest I bestowed upon you labor in vain. Now, Paul's telling these professing believers that there was a time when they did not believe God, and in that time period when they didn't believe God and God, they didn't know God and God didn't know them, there was a, a little bit of, a, of a, uh, an excuse for their, their raunchy, idolatrous behavior. They had a little bit of an excuse because they didn't know God, but now that they've believed... There is no excuse for the spiritual adultery that's going on. It does amaze me how, just how quick people can get snared back into their old ways after they've been saved. What a, I understand getting snared into it. I understand, you know, hanging out with the wrong crowd and you know being attracted to that to that old way of life. But what I don't understand is exactly how quickly people willingly run back to what they have just escaped. Hey, you need to put some separation between the new man and that old rotten flesh. You need, you need to do it or you're going to get snared and you're going to run back to it. But too often people treat their salvation like it's some type of license to sin. That's not what salvation's for. Salvation is for freedom from sin. Whenever you trust Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, you are free from the bondage that comes with sin. If we're going to identify with Christ, we're going to live the crucified life. I'm here to tell you today that the only easy day for a Christian is yesterday. That's it. There, today's not going to be easy. Tomorrow ain't looking good either. Next week, it's going to be, it's going to be rough as a Christian. Romans 8, verses 5 through 18 here. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the Spirit the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So then, they that are in the flesh cannot please God. Think about that every time you get in the flesh. is what I'm doing right now pleasing to God. If you're looking at it and, and you know what you're doing can't please God, quit doing it because you're free from that bondage. You don't have to do it. You can choose to do it all you want to. There's not, there's not a person on this planet that's going to go the rest of their life without sinning. Just because you're going to go the rest of your life without sinning, that does not mean that you have to choose to sin. If you're going to sin, let it be by accident. Don't choose sin. But ye are not in the flesh, is verse 9, but you're not in the flesh... But in the Spirit, if so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the Spirit of Him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, He that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by His Spirit that dwelleth in you. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors, not to the flesh to live after the flesh. Keep, you don't owe that rotten flesh a thing. You don't owe it any sin. That doesn't mean you can't still do it. You don't owe it to the flesh, though. Let's keep on going here. Remember, we're in Romans 8, verse 13. For if ye live after the flesh, ye shall die. And if ye live through the Spirit, do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. There's that Abba, Father again associated with that adoption that we're talking about in Galatians 4. The Spirit itself 
beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with Him, that we may be also glorified. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. When you identify with Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, when you cling to Scripture as your final authority, you are going to have people, including family, lifelong friends, Friends, classmates, neighbors, and church-going apostates, even some of them, the, the, even, even preachers' kids, and everything you can imagine, you're going to have those people despise you and ridicule you and slander you, and they'll do all of that because they hate the book. That's why they'll do it. They can't get to God, so they'll attack you. And if you're living the crucified life, guess what? It's going to happen. Your easy days are over. But why do so many people hate this book? Because this book knows every dirty secret about you. Every single one, every detail, every dark spot on your heart, this book knows it and it will expose it to you if you'll read it. This book will show you everything you need to know about yourself. That's why they hate it. There was a time in every apostate Christian's life, and I say apostate Christian, I'm talking about somebody like these people in the book of Galatians who have believed and have turned on to chase fables. They're still, they're still blood-bought, but now they're living in the flesh. That's what that means when you're an apostate Christian. You're not living for God. You're, you're going opposite of it. But there was a time in these apostate Christians' life when they looked at this book and they said, you know what, I believe that book right now. I, I believe it. That's the Word of God. Maybe not this book. They, a lot of them hate that King James Bible. Because that, that King James Bible, it will expose every little flaw in those other little perverted copies that, that are out there. But there was a time these apostates would look at this book and say, hey, that's, they, I recognize it as the truth. Now, they twist it up, mark it up, tear it out. They do everything they can to take away from the Word of God so that they can, with a clear conscience, feed their rotten, dead flesh. That's, that's what the apostate does. Let's go on to verse 12, Galatians 4. Brethren, I beseech you, be as I am, for I am as ye are. Ye have not injured me at all. Ye know how through infirmity of the flesh I preached the gospel unto you at the first, and my temptation was in my flesh. Ye despise not, nor rejected, but received me as an angel of God, even as Christ Jesus. Where is then the blessedness ye spake of? For I bear record that if it had been possible, ye would have plucked out your own eyes and had given it to me. You know, it's like you leave it up to an apostate Christian to, to sit here and label somebody as, as judgmental, hateful, bigoted, all that, all that garbage that's out there, all because they hate this book. And oh, we, we just love God so much. God is love. Oh my goodness. Your God is a fairy tale if all you believe about Him is He is love. God is a lot of things, including wrath and judgment and mercy and grace. He's a lot of things, way more than just this fairy tale apostate, God is love and God is going to provide money in my bank account. God is getting preached on every corner in this dang on community. Every one of them. God's way more than that. He's a, a way bigger gun than that. Oh, you're putting God in a box by saying that it's the, the King James is His Word. No, we're lifting up what God has lifted up. You, know, you look at those apostates 10 years from now, they're going to still be doing the same apostate stuff that they're doing. Unless somebody comes along and, and, and is willing to to be the target for them, to show them the error, they're going to still be doing that same garbage. I think about what's, what's going on here with Paul. And he, he's talking about, you know, where's this blessedness you speak of? Where, where's, all, where's all this love from these apostate Christians? Afraid to tell you the truth. That's not love. 
For I bear record, if it had been possible, ye would have plucked out your own eyes and had given it to me. Back when Paul told them the truth originally, back when they believed the Gospel originally, back when they recognized that book as the final authority and as truth, they would have done anything for Paul. Even plucked out their own eyes and given them to him. You know, that right there, what we're talking about, plucking out their own eyes, you wonder what Paul's thorn in the flesh was. There is a high high, 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 99% percentile chance that his thorn in the flesh was his vision going bad. That's, that just is what it is. They would have plucked out their own eyes and given it to him. They knew that was something that Paul needed. There's, there's a high possibility. There's a chance that, I, that I'm wrong on that, and it's okay. If you can find where I'm wrong on it, I, I, I'd be happy to know what the, what the real affirmity is there because I've always wondered. I do believe it's his eyes, though. Am I therefore become your enemy because I tell you the truth? Well, the answer to that question is yeah. Paul, they hate your guts, man. And if you stand up there and you preach the gospel, you preach the, the, the whole counsel of Scripture, you give final authority to where final authority belongs, and they'll hate your guts too. I can promise you that. But I think about what he must have been going through here when he wrote verse 16. Let's read it again. Am I therefore become your enemy because I tell you the truth? So far, Paul has been stoned. I mean, they left him for dead. They stoned him, left him there. They thought he was dead, and that's probably why they quit. He's been stoned. He's been in prison. He's been beaten. He's been shipwrecked, snake bit. Not to mention the guilt that must have been on Paul the entire time in his ministry for the persecution that he put on the church himself before he got saved. Imagine just the... The agony the, and the, the mental torment that man must have been going through knowing that it wasn't just that long ago and I sat, I sat by and, and stoned Stephen to death. It wasn't that long ago. I mean, Paul persecuted the church so, so hard. He was hard. You know, he must have been going through that stuff when he wrote that. But, the, you know... When he, when he first started preaching to them, you know, they're all happy. Paul comes out. He, Paul, Paul's preaching the gospel. Now, Paul, Paul's doing this. But now, when he keeps on and keeps on and keeps on and he, and he lets the Word of God expose what's wrong, he lets the Word of God expose the, the spiritual adultery and the idolatry that's going on, now they're starting to hate him. Paul was treated by the people that he loved as an enemy all because he loved them enough to tell the truth. There is no harder person to present the gospel to than a person that you love. I remember those being some of the hardest conversations I've ever had. Many times I've had a conversation with somebody that I love, somebody I care about, maybe a classmate, maybe anybody, and that'd be the last conversation I've ever had with them. I remember not long ago, me and Brittany went to a Christmas party he went in there, hey, a Christmas party! We're there to celebrate the birth of Christ! I start telling people about the gospel. I ain't talked to some of them people now in, what, six years? Most of them. I didn't say nothing bad to them. I didn't tell them they needed to pour their liquor out or put their cigars out. Or I didn't tell them none of that. I told him, hey, I did tell one of them, hey, you a deacon in the church, you probably ought not to be crawling on that pool table half naked. I did tell that one something. But a lot of those people never spoke to me again. I'm good. At least somebody, somewhere, thought enough of them to tell the truth, no matter what kind of what what it did for their feelings. I don't care about your feelings. I I really only care for probably about four people spilling on the planet. Uh, one of them lays beside me at night, and the other ones, they, they sleep upstairs. O outside of the people's feelings, I really don't care. And I really don't care much about the ones that sleep upstairs' feelings either. I care about Brittany's because i got to put up with her if, uh, if, I, if I hurt them. Other than that, I don't care about people's feelings. And you know what else? Don't care about nothing. nobody's feelings. This book right here, don't care one thing about your feelings. God on the throne does not care about your feelings at all. You can feel whatever you want to feel. Verse 17, let me go on. 
They zealously affect you, but not well. Yea, they would exclude you that ye might affect them. But it is good to be zealously affected always in a good thing, and not only when I present, when I'm present with you. Let's go on verse 19. My little children, of whom I travail in birth again until Christ be formed in you, I desire to be present with you now and to change my voice, for I stand in doubt of you. Tell me, ye that desire to be under the law, do ye not hear the law? For it is written that Abraham had two sons, the one by bondmaid and the other by free woman. But he who was of the bondwoman was born after the flesh. But he of the free woman was by promise. Which things are an allegory, for these are two covenants. The one from the Mount Sinai, which gendered the bondage, which is Agar. For this Agar is Mount Sinai in Arabia, and answereth to Jerusalem, which now is, and is in bondage with her children. But Jerusalem, which is above, is free, which is the mother of us all. For it is written, Rejoice, thou barren that bearest not. Break forth and cry, thou that travailest not. For the desolate have many more children than she which hath an husband. Now we, brethren, as Isaac was, are the children of promise. But as then... He that, hath born, he that was born after the flesh persecuted him that was born after the Spirit, even so it is now. Nevertheless, what saith the Scripture? Cast out the bondwoman and her son, for the son of the bondwoman shall not be heir with the son of the free woman. So then, brethren, we are not children of the bondwoman, but of the free. When you're born again, you're born free. You're free from the yoke of bondage that comes with sin. You no longer have to live in the flesh. You can now live in the Spirit. I hear believers say all the time about their pet sins like, like smoking, drinking, doping, sexual immorality. Before I go on with this, Friday night at the bonfire... Um, lots of folks threw their threw one of their pet sins in the bonfire. They they took their they took their cigarettes and they they chucked them in there. I've been telling people a long time, smoking might not send you to hell, but it'll definitely make you smell like you've been there. And that um, they chucked them in there to get rid of them publicly in front of each other. You know they they've been they've been prayed over. But I'm gonna tell you what happens more often than not. More often than not, you'll get, you'll get born-again believers saying, well, 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 I just can't get rid of this pet sin. I can't, I can't do it. They, I, I can't stop smoking, drinking, doping, or, or, or I can't stop with my, my sexual immorality. Particularly, you start looking at, the, at those coming from that, uh, the, the sodomite community, the LGBTQ. We're going to throw S in there for sodomite for them. But you start looking at the group that comes out of that. Oh, I, I believe, but I was, I was born this way. You dang on right you were born that way. You were born a sinner, and you need to be born again. You need to be born again. <laughs> what, what tears me up, though? It really does tear me up. And... Some of you might feel this way about it. Oh, God doesn't make people born that way. Everybody's born a sinner. Every one of them, just because they sin a little bit different than you, don't make them any, any more dirtier in the eyes of God. I mean, that lying, stealing, uh, lying about somebody stealing, <laughs> whatever, uh, whatever, whatever it is, is just as bad as the filthiest faggot out there. Now, y'all don't have to like that word, but it's, the, it's what it is. They're just as dirty as the filthiest thing you can think of. If you haven't come to Jesus Christ through the blood, you're guilty of it all whether you've done it at all. Think about that. That was one conversation I had with a close friend of mine. He was, he was real hopped up and, and jacked up and anything that had to do with anything that, was, that, was, that he deemed that was queer, he didn't want nothing to do with it. And I said, well, man, that don't stop you from snorting that dope. I said, the Bible says you're guilty of one part of the law, one infraction, you're guilty of it all, so you might as well go out there and be, and be snorting, snorting dope off of you know what. 
He didn't like that. Took him about two, I think it took him about four years to talk to me. I talked to him a couple times since then. But you're guilty of one, you're guilty of all. The blood of Christ, though, cleanses from all. From all. From every bit of it. So when I hear these people say, well, well, I, I can't give up this sin. You don't know how long I've been doing this sin. That's horse crap. That's what that is. That's manure. I say, I say horse crap. That's different than, that's different than, than bull crap. Y'all know there's a difference there. That's horse crap. That's just something you've made up there. That's a, that's a lie you're telling yourself to make you, make you feel better. Oh, brother, I'm just addicted to this. No, you're living in the flesh. Say what it is. It's not an addiction. It's living in the flesh. If you're born again, you're alive, but you're living in that old rotten corpse and you've got the appearance of evil on you. You can get rid of it. The same God that saves you from sin will help you not sin if you ask. Sometimes you need to absolutely separate yourself from everything involved with that sin to get away from it and start adding to it some things that are godly, like maybe reading Scripture. Going, going, I'm, I'm going to tell you what, John, I'm about, to, I'm about to go off here. I'm about to go off on you, but not, not because of something you did, because of something somebody else did. I'm not going to call their name. I was with John not long ago. We were at a store. I'm not even going to say the store just in case the person's listening. I was at a store and somebody got mad at John because of all the time he was now spending at the church. Oh my goodness. I think that I, I just got silent over that thing, thinking to myself, man, here's a guy doing what he can, pouring himself into the church, pouring himself into the people at the church, pouring himself into, into changing things about himself so that he can be a better father, uh, so that he can be a better son, so that he can be a, a better husband. And then somebody from the past wanted to, to pull him back out of that. They wanted to appeal to the, appeal to the flesh. I'm going to tell you what, you come to Christ... You will alienate yourself from people who claim to love you. You will. When we're born again, we're born free. And to say that you can't stop sinning is absolutely horse dung. If you're sitting there believing that you can't stop sinning, you need to ask yourself, is my spirit truly separated from my rotten flesh? Or have I only given lip service to Christ? I'm not going to ask you if you feel saved because nothing in the Word of God has anything to do with your feelings. What I will ask you is that are you trusting Jesus Christ that He died for your sins according to the Scriptures, not according to your feelings, not according if you raise your hand and come down, I'll come pray on the altar or say, uh, say a little pinko commie prayer. That's what they want to do to you. They want to, they want to get you to believe everything else can save you besides faith. So have you trusted Jesus Christ by faith? Are you cut out of that rotten flesh? Or are you lost? There's no in-between. If you haven't believed the gospel, if you haven't believed that Jesus Christ, born of a virgin, gave His life on the cross for your sins, I say your sins because I know He's given it for my sins. If you haven't believed that He's given His life for your sins according to the Scriptures, not according to what you feel about the Scriptures or according to what somebody's twisted or, or told you some other time, but according to the Scriptures, past, present, and future, you've done nothing in there. If you, have you believed it according to the Scriptures and that He was dead and, rose, and buried and rose again the third day according to the Scriptures? Have you believed that? And if you have, then you're cut out of that flesh. 
Have you identified with that man that was on the cross, identified with that man that was in the tomb, and identified with that man that walked right out of that tomb before they rolled the stone away? Have you identified yourself with that man? If you're living the crucified life, it's going to be hard. If you haven't trusted Jesus, I want to ask you, would you trust Him today before it's everlasting too late? Father God, Lord, we come to You, Lord, today in the name of Jesus, Lord, the name above all names, God. Lord, we thank You today for the, the reading and the hearing of Your Word, Lord. Lord, there's things in Your Word that's, that's offensive because it's offensive to our flesh, Lord. Our flesh doesn't like to be told that we can't do this or we can't do that or, or, or we're not pleasing You. Lord, we, I pray, Lord, that we can... We can remember, Lord, that we're crucified with You when we believe, Lord. And there's a certain amount of, of pain and suffering that comes with that, Lord. Lord, I know we don't have easy days as a Christian while we're here, Lord, but we long for those easy days that are coming where we get to worship You in glory, Lord. Lord, we thank You for all that You do. And if there be one that doesn't know You as Lord and Savior, I pray they come to know You before it's everlasting too late. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. These uh.